And we're back for part three. Welcome on driving your leadership performance. We're going to talk about KPIs and strategies for efficient meetings. So let's get started. Randy said that leaders are real people too. A good reminder for all of us and real people have feelings. And when you're, you know, in love with your work and passionate about it, it's so fun to throw yourself into it and work all day and night and, you know, uh, spend like your free time you spend on the business because you love what you're doing. But what happens when you fall out of love with your business or you feel yourself falling out of love? Can you like remind you, like we, I've spoken with entrepreneurs like that, with clients like that, where they're like trying to remember their passion for their business. Is that like a sign that they should move on or switch gears or is there a, in, in the same way we have to choose our partners every day we have to like remind ourselves that we love our business no 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 i think what we need to do is we recognize that that, that you know it is a little cyclical okay there, there's ups and downs and sometimes you like and sometimes you don't just like any particular job there's some parts you like and some parts you don't but you got to do it all because that's part of the job i will say this though okay if there's ever an advertisement for spending time with a business coach Okay, when you're starting to fall out of love with 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 your business as a leader, that's the time. Not when it starts to impact you in such a negative way that you know you just want to throw it up. You spend you spend more time at your day job than doing anything else in life, right? Can you imagine going through life and there's people who do this who hate their job, okay? And it just um oh what's the word um it hollows them out. And then all of a sudden they're in their, their, their 40s, 50s, 60s plus, and they say, what did I spend my time doing here? I spent my whole life wishing to be retired from, from because that's when the good life is going to start. I, I think that's just sad, don't you? I, I think that it's much more important to say, listen, if we're spending more time at our day job, okay, we have to make sure that, that we're actually loving what we're doing, not in a fakey kind of way, but really honestly enjoy what we're doing. Right. Because when we do that, we're modeling for other people. And they pick up on these signals. Right. This is this is really important. But the reality is we're real people. Excuse me. And sometimes we don't enjoy parts of the job. OK. Or we don't enjoy the industry anymore. Or we don't enjoy in that particular case. Oh, my God. Just just. If anyone's listening to that, give me a call, okay? Honestly, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not gonna say I'll slap it out of you and you're gonna love it at the end. But I think at that particular point, and, and that's one of the reasons why you can't sometimes go to the board or go to your boss on these kind of conversations because they're not ones that where the outcome might be you know, a little different. If it's your own company, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're a partner in a company, okay? The conversation is very different than if you're an employee, right? Sometimes it's a question of saying, Okay, there's some parts of the job and, and that you don't like. There's some parts of the job that you're kind of not built for, but you found yourself into it. Um, uh, I had uh, had a session with somebody um, a couple of years ago. Uh, this person was um, probably one of the top um, um, symphony conductors in North America. I can't say the name for obvious reasons, right? But it turns out, despised the job. But it turns out he was like one of the best. Right. So what does he do? Okay. What does he do? He needs the money, right? It pays a lot apparently to, to, to be this. So it's a fascinating, a fascinating conversation. It was very, very hard to have with, uh, with, with anybody in the organization. Right. But you know what? You can have these kinds of conversations with somebody outside the organization. Right. And it certainly is not therapy. And it certainly is not, you know, whatever. It's sometimes tough questions and sometimes it's hard work. Right. Sometimes the reason why you don't like something is because you've got people around you that you don't like, in which case some of the conversation is, well, let's perhaps examine why that's the case. Okay, sometimes it's a question of we need to train those people to be a bit better because you may have trained them to be what they are, right? And you can't untrain them. You've got to give them, you know, external inputs to sort of say, okay, let's, let's reset it. Let's change that organizational culture to be one that you as a leader actually enjoy, right? So it depends on, on a whole bunch of different factors. There's a whole bunch of different modes of solution, if you will. Sometimes, you know, um, people pick up, up on little cues that you're leaving and those cues aren't good cues. So maybe the, it's not a question of bad employees, but it's a question of bad you. And you need a bit of fixing, not fixing. I mean, sometimes when you're aware most of the leaders I work with, uh, just as an example, 
um, they know what the answers to the questions are, but sometimes they don't know what the questions are to ask. And sometimes if you're able to say to somebody, have you considered such and such, what would happen if blah, 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 blah. And then all of a sudden it's, yeah, yeah, okay, this is exactly what, what needs to happen. You say, yeah, that's, that, that, that sounds exactly right. But if you consider this or this as well, and then it becomes a very different conversation, right? So there's, uh, I hate for anybody listening to this saying, okay, there's always coaching, it's always training, there's always communication, it's always hiring, it's always onboarding, it's always, well, let's just do retreats, let's all, but there's a, you know, there's a spot, if you will, uh, for a lot of these different things as a leader, because they're just tools and levers and that you can use to, frankly, have a great job, but also to empower everybody else so that, uh, that um, you're leading an organization that does uh, deliver on whatever the strategy is. And for people who are middle managers on this, there's a concept called leading from behind, where you don't have all the authority, right? But you do have the responsibility for actually getting stuff done, right? This is the kind of thing that you can do as well. Um, this is stuff you can do as well. Jesse, do you have a question before we before we sign off? I would say mine, um, they've all been fantastic topics. Mine is more of a, a question slash comment. Meetings and measurement and management and delegation. Um, I've listened to a few interesting things. And I guess I'm just looking for an opinion. So when it comes to meetings, do you stick to the same format all of the time or do you switch it up? Because there's, you know, 15 minute meetings seems to become a topic du jour. And then I was listening to a, a different leader speak not too, too long ago where they, they do the hour long meetings where someone comes prepared. So I guess opinion on short meetings, long meetings, or different styles of meetings. And the other question I have, um, so I've been doing the same career for 23 years uh, when I graduated from University of Alberta. Um, one of the things that I find interesting is in my 23 years, performance reviews and a lot of the KPIs we measure don't ever change. And so one of the things is how often should a business review, I guess, what they're measuring? Let's talk about KPIs first. Um, uh, does anybody remember something called the fax machine? Okay, how about telex? Okay, oh my God, we're dating ourselves, aren't we? Okay, what happened to these things? Okay, does everybody remember what it was like with before Google? Okay, how about before cell phones? Okay, how about before AI? Okay, gee, can you imagine what it was like before COVID, after COVID? Um, gee, how about uh, how about the, the the legal framework? Has that changed very much? Gee, we've got do we have competitors now from outside our jurisdictions, not just inside? The nature of coopetition between organizations has that changed a little bit? Um, and by the way, the board of directors, the shareholders, have their goals changed at all in the last twenty years? Probably, right? All these things have changed, and yet the KPIs have remained exactly, exactly, exactly the same. That is a problem. That is a major problem. Now, it could very well be that they examined all these things and then determined that, yes, these KPIs are exactly. But I would also suggest that management teams that don't have external input and don't have some of these tougher questions being asked, uh, okay? Typically find it easier just to keep on going. And uh, it's not a complacency. It's just, hey, it's worked well. We're profitable. People are happy. Clients are happy. It's, so therefore we don't want to make any change, right? We'll just, you know, la la la. We'll just pretend there's nothing changing and we seem to be doing okay. So we're just going to continue to manage the way we have. We're going to continue to train people the way we have. We're going to continue to uh, measure the way we have. Uh, we're going to continue. And, and all I can say is, is that one day you're going to wake up like the taxi cab industry and discover that somebody's figured out Uber or the hotel industry and somebody's figured out Airbnb, right? Or you name almost any industry where there's been incredible transformation and disruption, right? And say, okay, how do we miss this? hotel industry, they're very well managed, right? They're very well financed. Same taxis, oh, they were locked in with regulation, okay? And yet, and I could go through a whole bunch of other industries as well, 
Okay, what happened to BlackBerry? Why is everybody's phone kind of look like the iPhone now? Okay, what happened to BlackBerry? Okay, these are very dramatic, dramatic examples. But every single client we've dealt with, okay, um, um, will say at some point, oh, good question. Oh, I hadn't thought of that. Okay, gee, I think we probably should take another look at, at why. It's not saying change is necessary, but there needs to be a decent process for examining the weak signals out in the marketplace and understanding exactly what's actually happening um, to make sure that the board of directors and separately, the senior leadership team are on the same page. Okay, I was just talking about this leadership retreat that Rania and I were running um, um, just, just the other day. There's so many ahas that happened in that meeting, right? Not just relationship building, but real ahas, right? Mm -hmm. This is what ends up saying, okay, we uh, maybe our KPIs should be changed, okay? And by the way, you know, how about dashboards? How about concepts like balanced scorecard or, or ESG? There's all so many different things that are that are sort of available now in terms of tools and ideas that that, that sometimes. I'll call it legacy thinking managers and, and boards um, haven't really considered. And, and they should, because there's no reason why some disruptor should eat your organization's lunch uh, just because you haven't considered these things. And by the way, the KPIs may be exactly the same at the end, but your confidence in your decisions will be vastly different. Number two, the question of meetings. Um, Second, I want to push on this point a little bit, if I may. I want to thank uh, Jesse for the question. Key performance indicators. This is linked to performance. Wouldn't it be that if the company changes their model or the way that they're performing, that the KPI, like some companies just stay the same. We we sell boxes, moving boxes. I don't know. I, maybe I don't know the industry well enough, but like some things don't change and some companies are more experience, more change, more evolution. Does that play into it? Like that would definitely have to force your hand rattle to uh, change how what you measure. So... <laughs> Okay, it would become so easy if you had people that you work with that just said, yes, Randall, yes, Randall. <laughs> <laughs> Randall, but, you're great, but I want to help Jesse get answers to his questions. Yeah, but what I would say is this. Um, if an organization's strategy, I'm not talking about the execution of what they do every single day, but the strategy is kind of where we want to be in the future, right? And how we're going to do it. And what's the business model that's necessary in the and the systems, the technology, the people, the process, all that kind of stuff drives from that strategy. So if the strategy remains the same, okay, then the KPIs that measure the progress towards each strategic initiative should stay the same, right? Um, you know, they, um, if on the other hand, if there's different strategic initiatives, right, um, then the KPIs need to change, right? And so the question becomes, is the process that an organization goes through to set the strategy, is that actually kind of a modern strat a modern approach, like a decent approach that looks beyond? Okay, or is it once again, this complacency of we've always done strategy this way, we've always done planning this way, we've always done our board retreats or management retreats this way. Okay, maybe there's a, maybe there's a different way of doing that. But the output, of, no matter what they do, the output of it is, is okay, here's the strategy, here's the initiatives. Are we going to measure against progress on these initiatives? And and yeah, it could be exactly the same. Okay, if it's just box making boxes from cardboard, maybe there's no change. There's no change in business model. There's no change in strategy. There's nothing different. In which case, exactly what you're saying. On the other hand, most I would say businesses, the business is not static. The underlying market is not static. The future is is there's different scenarios, etc. That you might be planning for. So therefore, the KPIs, KPIs might be different. Jesse, your question, is, is, that, is that fair enough, Rania, or are you going to push some more? <laughs> Jesse, how much are we pushing? Do you need more clarity there? No, that's perfect. You know, the, the question came from, I was listening to it, and they were measuring the same thing because their industry didn't change very much. Mm, and as long great. as those KPIs looked good, they kept measuring to the same KPI. But sometimes if a KPI is measuring positive, but there's an underlying root cause that isn't, uh, you know, so if the KPI says we're doing good, but the word on the street is you're hearing different than the KPI, I find sometimes the stagnant KPI can be measured because it makes it look good versus someone challenging what the measurement is and what the actual underlying factor is. Yeah. Um, so we, I'm in an industry where we don't change very often. Um, however, 
to continue to measure the same thing that has 99.7% KPI performance. Like that sounds good in a meeting, but the, there's sometimes there's some underlying causes there that don't match the measurement. And so, so yeah. If I, it, if I were coaching uh, the leader of your organization, which, which may be you, Jesse, I, I don't know, but if I were coaching uh, um, the, the, the leadership, what I would say is this, pardon me, what KPIs, if you're measuring, would you get 60, 70% on? And then how strategic would be, um, you know, how strategic could it be, um, you know, if you were to move that 60, 70% up to 80, 90%, okay? Are there any KPIs that you would get 30% on, right? Now, of course, key performance indicators, you'd say, well, it's not key, therefore we wouldn't even be measuring. That's fine, that's fine. Tell, tell me which are the non-key uh, performance indicators you're getting 30, 40% on. Also, also say something else. Um, there's a problem that I call in, in KPI land called the, the problem of 70%. Do you remember back in school, you know, if you got 70%, you thought, oh, that's pretty good. Yeah, that's pretty good, right? And, and, and what would happen when you got the, the 99%? You would say, I'm king of the world. I'm the best there is, right? You're the top of the class, okay? Nothing to do here, okay? There's no change. I'm doing everything. The problem with this, the problem with 70% is you kind of feel the same way. It's good. It's good. Nothing to do here. But what happens when you get that 40% on the test? 40% on the test, you're, oh, no, I got to speak to mom and dad. I got to speak to my significant other. Oh, I'm going to fail. I, I got to buckle in. I got to do something different, right? The problem with 70% is that what happens when a competitor suddenly starts getting 90%, 95%. And 70% reads complacency within the organization um, <laughs> um yes uh would you be happy with it you said what jesse was it 99.75 percent what was it was that, the that was it. It, we do have a fill rate require uh metric of 97.5 percent so so jesse <laughs> if you were a, if i were a pilot in an airplane would you be happy with a 97 point 99.75 you know, probability of landing without killing everyone? No, probably not. How, how about a surgeon? Do you, do you think that 99.75% of the people don't die is, is, a, is a good? No, you need 100%, right? Um, I'd ask another question. How much money is being spent in, in filling fill rates, for example? What's the cost of doing 99.75? If it was just merely 98%, would you save a huge amount of time? And dollars, if you reduce the fill rate to a lower number, right? I, I don't know the answer to that, but I think these are great questions to ask. And I think that these are the kinds of things that good managers don't ask because things are humming along just fine. But sometimes the outsider, on the other hand, can, can ask questions that are uncomfortable, right? What's the worst thing? You fire me, right? Kind of thing. So. Um, meetings, uh, let me touch on that one briefly. So, so the question is, should meetings always be the same? Um, should meetings always be the same? You should the style, should they change, et cetera? Uh, I'd ask one question actually before then. What's the purpose of each individual person being in a particular meeting? Are, do they need to be there? Are they there optionally? Are they there just for their information? Right? Are they there because they are part of the decision-making apparatus? What's number two? What's the purpose of the meeting? Is it, is it to inform? Is it to come to a consensus on something? Is it to plan a particular set of activities? Is it just a quick update? But what is the purpose of that meeting? So for example, if you're running a, you know, you're doing some transformation project in your organization and you're having a weekly sort of status, sort of temperature check meeting, Okay, is everything going well? And everybody in the meeting has got to report on what they're specifically responsible for. And, and with something's going awry, at least you could do something about it earlier. And every meeting, that every single meeting, that's exactly what it is. And the agenda is particularly set because it, the purpose of that meeting. On the other hand, if you're doing, say, a, um, a monthly financial update, Right, the, 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 you know, it's, it's, a, it's a week or so after the, the, the close and, and you now have the statements and you're now talking as a management team as to what it actually means. Um, well, guess what, okay? The purpose of the meeting and the length of the meeting might be very different, right? 
On the other hand, some people do stand-up meetings, like for two minutes, say, you know, five, ten minutes. Everyone gets their two minutes, go around the room. Okay, this is what I'm going to accomplish today. Here's the blockers, and, you know, here's blah, 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 and, 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 and a few other quick questions. And away it goes, and it's a great way to quickly do this, and everyone disperses. But there's all kinds of little one-on-one -on -one conversations that, that might happen. Uh, Ronnie and I, we've got a standing one-hour meeting every day. Okay, and what's on there is all the stuff that, that Ronnie has done, all the stuff that I've done. We bring each other up to date. We debate things back and forth. Okay, um, you know the, um, you know, so so the purpose of the meeting drives it. But sometimes, you know, if you use uh, any management systems, okay, um, uh, EOS, uh, you know, from Traction, for example, there's a whole bunch of others. They'll specify, okay. Every week there's this meeting. Every month, quarter there's this this kind of meeting. Once a year there's this meeting. Here's the very set agenda, etc. So if you're using any of those management systems, it's kind of prescribed for you. But by the way, blindly following those systems is frankly not a good idea either, right? So so I think that it needs to be changed, okay? So that their purpose fit and and the right people are are actually there. The other thing I would say very very strongly is this: Why can't we just like if we're talking about the board meeting? Why can't we give people pre-prep responsibilities beforehand? Before the meeting, this is what I expect. Everyone will have read this, contributed, like we're going to brainstorm. Do some pre-brainstorming by yourself. Then we get together, we brainstorm together, and, and we put something, you know. Um, I think that there's also benefits for making change for change's sake. You know, we always have that Friday morning meeting. Okay, let's try it for the next two months, every Monday morning instead. All of a sudden, it changes the dynamic. We all know these you know, the psych experiments about you know you've got a whole bunch of factory workers, okay, and they you know, they turn the light on and they increase the productivity and then it sort of slowly slowly goes down a little bit. Then they turn the lights off. There's an uptick of pro of productivity that it slowly goes down and everything. So sometimes trying a little bit of a change is not a bad thing. It because it not, might not necessarily productivity or whatever you're measuring it might not actually go down, but what it might do is it might expose other opportunities. They actually have some have some merit. I want to share what I love a lot about our meetings here is I think that meeting times time so much time gets wasted because they don't understand what the meeting is for. The meeting is to make decisions, in my view. And if you're not bringing material to the meeting where people to unblock, I'm not I'm not clear what you're meeting about. You don't need to meet at that point. So yes, we're social creatures and we enjoy being together and there's lots and lots of benefits that come from the meetings, including, you know, building relationships, supporting each other, getting new ideas and role modeling for your team. But if there's no, just like all message Randall saying, I don't, I don't, I don't have anything completed to show you that I need to unblock you. I don't need to say, here's my progress and give me a cookie. You know, sometimes I want cookies, but if there's, <laughs> if there's <laughs> sometimes you want so 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 let me just sort of uh, uh, do a counter argument. I'll give you a particular case of a counter argument. One of the things we'll, we'll do: we've got a a, a a continuous professional development, a CPD program for for for, for organizations. The idea is to get everyone on the same page. Just think about this. Um, one of the reasons why people will get together is for exactly what Rania said, or some of the ideas that I shared earlier. And you may have other reasons why you, you're involved in meetings, but but one of the meeting, one of the reasons why you might want to have a meeting is to generate alignment and by introducing ideas um, together and having that conversation. So in our CPD thing, we, we say you have to have a meeting once a month where we'll present a concept uh, and we've got about 75, 80 of these concepts, you choose which ones, uh, for, for 45 minutes and we'll facilitate a conversation Q&A for 15 minutes. And, and, and this is a particular meeting to get everybody on the same page. There's no decisions to be made. Okay. You don't see that as training, Randall? I said it's training. Ah, but there's the question. Okay. Are these really two sides of the same same coin? Is if you're doing a regular meeting on production stats and everything like that, you're also communicating as a leader to the team. Okay. Um, you know, and you're making a decision and all that kind of stuff. Because you're you're doing this and the people are learning from you as a leader, is that training or is that a meeting? In that particular case, I'd probably say, well, that's a meeting, but training takes place. You know, sometimes not explicitly. This other kind of meeting, which I was just describing, is is I would probably say, well, that's that's training, but it's a meeting specifically of people to accomplish something where there's this facilitated conversation, right? So is it's it's more training than meeting, but it's it's a reason why people are getting together, right? And that becomes a lot easier 
okay, to say, actually, Ronnie, to your point, there's a purpose for this particular meeting, right? Yeah. The purpose is, is that over the months, we want to introduce a lot of different specific concepts in the organization and have everybody have the same language, right? And, 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 and everything. So, so that, that, that's, the same. Uh, by the way, uh, that, 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 that CPD that we do, we also have uh, every week after that, there's a, you know, three, four paragraph little tip sheet that sort of ties back the learning, like micro learning kind of thing. So, so that's, um, oops, sorry about that. I have another thought about meetings. Yeah. I like to enjoy my colleagues and like to have, you know, quote unquote fun in our meetings. But I also think Randall and I, we really set the tone right at the beginning. We, you know, how are you? Good. How are you? Good. And let's get to work. How was your weekend? Fine. And you're fine. We don't eat up the first six minutes talking about, you know, the great sandwich we had yesterday at lunch. So setting that tone that how socializing happens versus how to role model, not wasting time. and. Um, for me, you know, be ready, be excellent. We did a training on this yesterday. Show up being fully aware when you're on and off mic, how to speak. And we don't spend half the meeting going, you're muted, you're muted, you're muted, I can't hear you. And have all your tabs open, have everything ready you want to share. If you share a link to a file and nobody can open it and you're spending time trying to get them access, I mean, what are, what, what are we doing? What are we doing, right? So yeah. for me, it's about creating that culture that we're coming to the meeting to work and we can still play but there's no time to play if we don't work efficient, effectively. And by the way, honestly, I, you probably are telling you know, Ronnie and I obviously enjoy each other's company. So <laughs> I, have to, I have to, I have to, I have to let people know that uh, uh, you know she 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 went back from you know the the event that we we're facilitating um, back uh, to 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 her uh, home city and 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 she 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 says you know i love music and she says i listen to this great song so yes in our meeting today she played a song from spotify and we had a good laugh and it was <laughs> it was good so it you know it's not like work 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 i mean that's not the essence of leadership but when we're when when it's time to work everyone's got to be on that same page right yeah. and 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 making sure that you have it but can you imagine every single week if half of your meeting is spent doing you know blah 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 you know um that is that is not task focused and uh, you know i think it's you know we talked at the very beginning of, of our time about the dichotomy of leadership there's this but there's that you know are we are we are we uh, are we people focused leaders are we task focused leaders right it's good you know task focused leaders get it done hey this is important we got to make sure this is the deadline do it do it okay people you know oh i just want to make sure you're fully prepared and here's this and here's that etc uh, and and the the what I would suggest on that one is it's not about us as leaders, but what is it that your particular direct reports actually need? Because if they are a task focused person, they'll not appreciate all this blah blah blah, right? If they're a people kind of oriented person, um, if you say drive to the task, okay, there's gonna, it's going to be a, a bit of an oil and water. You've got to be aware of what they need in order to get the most out of them, right? So, so you know, I like to think that, that Rania is um, a people, she's totally a people-oriented person <laughs> on one side of the coin, but on the other side of the coin, she's very task-focused, okay? And, and I think that I'm, I'm the same way. And so therefore, the interaction of what each of us might need during a particular meeting is something that I think we both are very sensitive to because we're, we're both leaders, right? But I think on the other hand, so often as leaders, we're in our own head, right? Why? Because there's the urgent versus important stuff that, that we talked about earlier. Um, and sometimes it's a bit harder, just a bit harder uh, to actually say, okay, what do I need to get out of my team as a whole to get this organization to where it actually needs to be? Jesse, we shared some ideas, but was this, this answer your question in terms of the pacing and type of meetings you want? Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm I'm a big believer of uh, changing up the meeting format specific to the topic of what you're trying to get out of the meeting. The the question originated a little bit because the concept of this leader's meeting was the person who organized the meeting to get their concept had to do the preparatory work. But instead of sharing that prep work two weeks out from the meeting, it was distributed when the meeting started. And for the first 15 minutes of the meeting, everyone read the, the prep work. So that everyone read it, everyone was prepared, everyone was on the same page. And I was like, it was an interesting 
concept that I haven't seen in action because you can send prep work out two weeks, two months, two days, and inevitably half the room isn't going to read it because of the urgent things that end up on their desk. And so, so uh, it was an interesting concept. Uh, I just, I just gotta, I just gotta speak to this, Jesse. Okay. This is a quiz for, 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 for everybody. Who's the person that actually put that particular technique on the map? Because it isn't particular. Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos said, hey, listen, if we need to deal with an issue, we're all going to get in a room. We'll have that one piece of paper. We're all going to sit there for 15 minutes or however long. We're going to read through it so everyone is completely fresh on the idea. And I think that one of the things I love about that is that he shook things up, right? But I think like the pendulum that swings all the way to one side, okay, I really think that when you do that, you lose a bunch of things. So let me ask you, if you're going to, if you're working on a project, you got a big deliver, a huge presentation, whatever it is, and you do it like minutes before, I'm sure it'll be good, right? Because you're, you're smart, you're a leader, you know, all that kind of stuff. And you'll deliver it very well, whatever it happens to be. But what happens if you actually prepared it and completed it a week earlier or two weeks earlier? Okay. If you did it a week earlier, two or three days before the actual meeting, okay, or presentation or whatever it is, you take a look at the work you did and say, oh, I thought of something else. Oh, I thought of something else, right? Oh, I thought of something else. And all of a sudden, when the meeting comes, the presentation, whatever it happens to be, it's going to be much, much better because that subconscious of yours has, has been working. Or maybe there's been some input. You know, I talked about Nemawashi, okay? And then all of a sudden, you're socializing the ideas and somebody points out something that to implement that idea, you need to make this change, which you incorporate, which you can't if you do it minutes before. The problem of people not preparing for meetings is not the problem of the people who are not preparing the meetings. The problem there is the leader's problem. Because if the leader is setting a culture where people are not prepped for meetings, it's the leader. It's not the people, right, period. And, and so, so I'm not suggesting you have a problem, Jesse, as a leader or in, in your organization. What I'd say here is, is that uh, what's been allowed to develop is a culture where, um, the urgent and the important are, are, are being mashed together in a way that causes people to not act in a way that's in the be in the longer term best interest of the organization. You know, if, if it turns out that people just by the nature of the business, it is really hit after hit after hit after hit. It's just nonstop urgent. Okay. Um, uh, what I would suggest then is you, you set up a meeting uh, two weeks before for, for 15 minutes, you give everybody the piece and say, we're going to sit in this room and we're actually going to, we're going to read it. We're not going to talk about it. Okay. People can ask a clarifying question if they like. Okay. After we've done that, we'll see you later. We're meeting about it in a week and a half, two weeks. And that will allow you to do two things, ensure that everyone's prepared. Okay. And this is obviously in a case where everything's so urgent, right? So hive off that, that particular time. It'll also allow you a little bit more time to do that Nimawashi thing in between. It'll also allow everybody's ideas to sort of percolate. It'll also allow you to do one other thing. You can ask people at that pre-meeting that let's read it together for 15 minute meeting. You can ask them, can you take a few minutes? Okay. And just shoot me a quick text or email about how you do such and such. Okay. <laughs> I think you're going to get a bunch of ideas, but more importantly, you're going to get them thinking about it. And then by the time you get to the real meeting, okay, you know, the, the race car is already going, right? You're not starting from zero. And you don't have this issue of no one's read it because everyone's attended that meeting that you just had that pre meeting, right? So I don't know if this, this helps or anything, Jesse, but I, I really think that, yeah. that the leaders need to step up, okay? And who's going to tell them to do that? It's not the people that report to them. Yeah. No, it's yeah. fantastic. It's, uh, you know, it was actually a podcast with Jeff Bezos that I was listening to. And then he followed up with that as well, saying um, not only do they do the 15 minute pre prep, but then the last person to speak about uh, commentary or feedback or suggestions on the prep of what the meeting was, was him. So he actually went to his um, the lowest senior member of the room and had them start because he said often if the CEO or the the main leader of in the meeting gives feedback first, everyone else's feedback is going to follow that suggestion because no one wants to debate or disagree. 
with yep. the leader. And so that's what I, I'm the I'm not in the line of business where this type of meeting typically makes sense, to be honest with you. Um, but it was just an interesting perspective. And and when I first heard him say it, I was like, oh, my goodness, I would dread that type of meeting. And then as I kind of thought about it further and deeper, I was like, ah, you know what, it's probably an interesting concept in the right right time and and with the right culture and leadership and, and all the rest already ingrained. So, yeah. Uh, I can't wait for the next session because uh, this is uh, th this is valuable. I'm going to share with you a URL. I shared two, but I'll share another one. This is the events page on our Brain Trust website. It has all kinds of things, but it does have our monthly free um, leadership session like this, where we come and get ideas with each other. When when you are feeling stagnant, uh, it certainly is a great place to pick up new ideas and connect with your peers. So you can check there. You can register for all of them. Put them on your calendars. And again, there's that link in the, if you want to do a one-on-one -on -one with Randall, he's happy to talk about your uh, business um, and we can talk about your teams and your company. Okay. Well, thank you, Randall and everyone here who joined and listened in. If there are any issues that we talked about today that resonate with you uh, or you're considering a change in your organization, do reach out. We'd be happy to have a conversation. Um, and, you, and again, you can join us live for our monthly live events. You can email us at info at and we'll follow you and follow us on LinkedIn.